second part of chapter 60. When the secret of Smike's ancestry, of his family, of the wickedness of his father is finally revealed. Addressing the brothers, but pointing to Ralph Nickleby, Broker said, Among those who once had dealings with this man, between 20 and 5 and 20 years ago, there was a rough, fox-hunting, hard-drinking gentleman who lived with his sister in a country house in Leicestershire. They had both inherited money from their father, but separately. The brother had wasted his inheritance on self-indulgence, and he would have given anything to steal his sister's inheritance too. Pointing at Ralph, he went on, This man knew both brother and sister and visited them many times at their house in Leicestershire. As you gentlemen know, when a woman marries, whatever money or property she has becomes her husband's. Under the terms of her father's will, she could not marry and without her brother's consent. If she did, her money would go to another branch of the same family. Again pointing to Ralph, he continued, This man was as keen as the brother to get his hands on the sister's inheritance, and he wound his way into her good graces so that finally, she agreed to marry him. He was aware that without her brother's consent, which he knew would never be given, the money would slip from his grasp. His only hope was that the brother should die in some hunting accident, which at the, at the time seemed fairly likely. So they married, but secretly. No one ever knew. The result of their union was a son, but the baby was kept hidden and sent to a nursemaid miles away so that his mother scarcely saw him. Nickleby treated her cruelly. Finally she could take his cruelty no longer, and she left him for a younger man. He was enraged and saw, swore to find and bring her back which is where I come into the story. The wife and her, her lover were never found, but eventually news came that she had died. Of course, something had to be done about the child. He couldn't be hidden away forever. Nickleby has used me ill. He has made me do things which were against my nature cruel, heartless things, as I told him when we met lately in the street. I threatened to reveal a secret which would bring him down, but he didn't seem to care. You see, when news of his wife's death, death came, I decided to tell him that the boy was dead too. He was away at the time, and while he was not at home, I took the child and lodged him in the garret of Nickleby's own house in Golden Square. When he came back six weeks later, I told him with every circumstance well planned and proved nobody could have suspected me, that the child was dead. It was my intention to use the secret to get money from him. I had heard that there were schools in Yorkshire which took in boys whose parents didn't want them. I took the child to one kept by a man named Squeers. And that is where I left him. I gave him the name. Smike. 
year by year, I paid twenty pounds for his board, and for six years, I continued to pay, never breathing the secret all the time, for I had left his father's service uh, after more hard usage and quarrelled with him again. I was sent away from this country. I've been away eight years. Directly I came home, I, I travelled down into Yorkshire and skulking in the village of an evening time, made inquiries about the boys at the school and found that this one, who the one I had placed there, had run away with a young man bearing the name of his own father. I sought his father out in London, hinting that I could tell him I tried for a little money to support life. But he repulsed me with threats. I then found his clerk, going on little to little, showing him that there were good reasons for communicating with me, learnt what was going on. And what it was, I who told him. I told him that the boy was no son of the man who claimed to be his father. All the time I had never seen the boy, at length I, I heard from the same source that he was very ill and, and where he was and I, I travelled down there that, that I might recall myself if possible to his recollection and confirm my story. I came upon him unexpectedly but before I could speak he knew me. He had good cause to remember me poor lad and I would have sworn to him that if I had met him in the Indies I knew the piteous face that I had seen in that little child. After a few days' indecision, I appealed to the young gentleman in whose care he was, and I found that he was dead. He knows how quickly he recognised me again, how often he had described me and my leaving him at the school, and how he had told him of a of a garret in his father's house to this day. This is my story. I, I demand to be brought face to face with the schoolmaster and put to any possible proof of any part of it, and I will show that it's too true and that I have this guilt upon my soul. Unhappy man, said the brothers, what reparation can you make for this? None, gentlemen, none. I have none to make and nothing to hope for now. I am old in years and older still in misery and care. This confession can bring nothing upon me but new suffering and punishment. But I take it and I will abide by it, whatever comes. I have been made the instrument of working out this dreadful retribution upon the hand of the head of a man who in the hot pursuit of his own bad ends has persecuted and hunted down his own child to death. It must descend upon me too. I know it must fall. My reparation comes too late and neither in this world nor in the next can I have any hope again. He had hardly spoken when the lamp which stood upon the table close to where Ralph was seated and which was the only one in the room was thrown down and left them in complete darkness. There was some trifling confusion in obtaining another light. The interval was a mere nothing. But when the light appeared, Ralph Nickleby was gone. The good brothers and Tim Linkinwater occupied some time in discussing the po possibility of his return, and when it became apparent that he would not come back, they hesitated whether or not to send after him. At length, remembering how strangely and silently he had sat in one immovable position during the interview, thinking he might possibly be ill, they determined, although it was now very late, to send to his house on some pretense. Finding an excuse in the presence of Brooker, whom they knew not, 
how to dispose of without consulting his wishes. They concluded to act upon this resolution before they went to bed. <laughs>